heard about this mysterious lady from the other side of the border, but had never seen her in the flesh. She filled the small room like a film star. Her makeup was flawless and she had an alluring beauty spot to the left of her upper lip. She stood in the center of Margaret's small house with a superfluous fur coat draped around her shoulders. The NR trio stood to remove it and prepare a chair for her. She sat and pulled a cigarette from a box, from its box. She looked around and frowned when she saw the baby. She retracted the stick into its sleeve. Margaret offered the guests some tea, but they declined politely. Something stiffer would be lovely. Charles, could I join you on that tiny drink you have there? Her voice was deep and husky. She laughed, her jaws unhinged, as though she had no restrictions in her life. He poured a glass for her promptly, and she sipped it. Ah, merci. Is this not what the good Lord ordered? The gentleman laughed lightly. Margaret adjusted her blouse and rolled her sleeves. Thomas passed a small envelope to Charles. While he opened it, he asked about the day's activities around the country. The Broken Hill boycott of the Queen's coronation last year was such a success that we have to emulate that level of organization, Thomas said. Yes, indeed. So who has been assigned to lead, assigned to lead the Indola group for this one? Lusaka is doing well, but here we're all too exposed, Gombe. The police are hot on our trail. There have been too many arrests and we are spending more time fundraising for the families of the incarcerated than we are on strategic planning. We need to change the approach for this one. Tomorrow, we need someone to go to the Polish butchery along Cecil Road. Someone who they, will, who they don't know what, or, or least expect. Someone fearless enough to enter the Europeans only door. Only then can our picketers come to the scene. Are we ready for it? Remember, this has to be peaceful. We have to select someone who is able to demonstrate great restraint. I don't know if a new person can manage that. We have thought through it carefully, sir. It has to be a person who the public will endear to. And when I say public, I mean both non-whites and whites. Who do you have in mind? Charles lay his article on its face. The group stopped what they were doing. Your wife, sir. Me? Margaret looked up from her badge sewing. Yes, you, but don't worry. Miss Fabiola will be there with you. Fabiola? But she could get deported, right? Yes, and you might get banished to some faraway village. In the best case scenario, back to Chinsali. But that won't happen. We, won't, we have some strong lawyers from our empathizers. They have made sure that you will have a watertight defense should things escalate to that point. The toddler crawled out of his cot, reaching for his mother. Rana CJ, you will do this for your country, won't you? Her husband's question bore into her while she felt her baby's soft hands stroking her leg. Her husband studied her face. There was a silence in the room except for the voices of the men outside. Margaret looked at the baby who was now climbing onto her lap. She looked at the NR trio, their eyes wide as saucepans. Fabiola moved to sit next to Margaret and the baby. She smelled of cinnamon. They have planned this very carefully. We can do it if we go over all the details tonight. Nothing will happen to your child, all right? She looked at the group of ladies, prompting them with a slow, prompting them with a slow nod, and they followed. We will be back home tomorrow, I promise. But my English, I, I express myself better in Bemba. Ah, but me too. I speak French, not English. We have scripts to practice for each scenario. If things get bad, I will sing in Lingala and you can back me up in Bemba, eh? <laughs> she laughed again. This time her sparkling eyes looked straight into Margaret's. Margaret could not resist a shy chuckle. The bunting along the glossy butchery flapped against its glass windows. There was no rain. The skies were a pleasant cloudless blue. Margaret looked at the reflection of herself next to Fabiola. The vinyl sign pasted across the top of the glass door was emblazoned with Europeans only. 
A white family whizzed past her like she was invisible. They strolled into the shop. Children half her age were allowed to go through a door that she could not. She thought of how every Friday, she lined up to purchase a parcel of sticky, rotten meat from the small hole in the wall at the back of the butchery. She closed her eyes to remember the flies buzzing towards the pond from the parcels she and her neighbors came home with. She thought of all the Africans around the country who in solidarity had said no to meat for the past few months. The vicious beatings and unnecessary imprisonment flooded her heart. In that moment, she felt deeply for all of them, as though each one of them were her son, CJ. She thought of the world which he would find if this law did not change. Shiny medallions of pork were served to the family in the window. The shop owner came around from the counter and knelt to talk to one of the children. He showed them a chart of a bull, demarcated and labeled at different parts of its body. The children pointed at the shank and then the rump. They livened up and licked their lips as their mother smiled proudly. Garnishes of parsley shone, shone green around the face of a dead pig. It smiled at Margaret from its bed of ice. Fabiola, it's time. Let's go inside. The two ladies held hands and walked into the shop. Its bell sounded and its patrons reeled in disbelief. Read the sign on the door. You can get your meat like everybody else from the hatch at the back on Friday. The overweight butcher said as he wrapped his fingers along the counter. They made a heavy gallop that echoed across the room. We would like a kilogram of chalk and two dressed chickens, please. Like everyone else, Fabiola said. You have to go through the back like all the Africans. It says clearly, Europeans only. Margaret interjected. Yes, indeed, but I am a citizen of Northern Rhodesia and unfortunately the Federation. I deserve to be served the same goods and services as everyone else, regardless of race, creed or color in any shop that I choose to enter. Please can I have my order? Two stern faced men who looked like the butcher may have many moons before stepped out to flank him. Fabiola continued to say the lines as they had practiced. Sir, you are in violation of the United Nations Charter Article 73. Can you promptly serve my friend and me and we will be out of your way. Get out. If you look at the sign below that one, it says reserve the right to entry. I am well within the law to ask you to leave peacefully. The ladies turned to look outside and there was a line of smartly dressed picketers. Cameras snapped pictures, the ladies next to the European families who had resigned to being locked inside. The ladies sat, sorry, next to the European families who had resigned, resigned to being locked inside. We will wait until we are served. We have all day. They pulled out their yarns of wool and began to knit. The pair of, bur of burly men came from around the corner and lifted the deer. They carried the women kicking and screaming to a cold room. The ladies were thrown to the cold floor. They sat up next to each other. Carcasses swung low in rows of pink and the metallic sharpness of blood filled their nostrils. After the steel door was shut tight and the room went dark, Margaret dissolved into tears. My son, my son, why did I let Charles talk me into this? What's going to happen to CJ if we die in here? Margaret banged on the door, on the walls, but they absorbed her actions, giving her silence in return. She flung her fists at the shadows of swinging beasts. I too had a son, Fabiola said quietly. Her voice filled the room as she sung of a baby taken away from her to a land far away. A baby who was neither white nor black, but both. Margaret froze, her heart breaking with each note. She sat next to Fabiola and they hummed together while they waited. By the time the authorities arrived, the entrance of the shop was cloudy with tear gas and the dispersing crowd was trotting down the road. Police escorted the ladies out, bundling them into the back of a Land Rover. Seven days after the event, Margaret arrived home with Charles. Fabiola was deported and banished for life 
from the Federation of Northern, Southern, Rhodesia, and Nyasaland. The sun would rise and set against the purple tree outside. She let the position of its shadow guide her sense of time. She refused to let her baby go. She cuddled him day and night. She would later stand in the crowd as Charles and Thomas closed the hatch with the, with the Polish butcher. Brick by brick, the gentlemen layered the hole with wet cement until it existed no more, until it became history. A story that would be told one day. The men shook hands in front of the cameras and signed documents with the Chamber of Commerce and read their speeches. At last, a basic human right was granted to Africans and all non-whites. At last, they could enter any public shop with dignity. At last, Fabiola was gone. Thank you. <laughs> Except she wasn't, was she? Fabiola was not really gone. Fabiola never went anywhere. <laughs> Listen, um, this is a story about uh, Bupe and Maggie, who are this particular Maggie's, this particular Maggie's grandchildren, but you pack so much into that one chapter. Can you tell us how that particular creative process went? And uh, before you tell us that particular creative process, I wanna actually engage with your parallels with because you are you are Jamaican, Zambian, a Nigerian, and, and you have so many parallels with this character. So can you tell us the creative process together with those parallels? How did that work? Okay, so in, in um, I love I love how diplomatic you are, you like the parallels. Um, I've been asked many times, is this your story? Just tell us. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> not. <laughs> no, well, I know you've got siblings. Maggie yeah. has the only child. <laughs> yes, but um, it is true. It, it, it is a semi autobiography, autobiographical. Yeah, see, I can't even speak because you made me. This is the I first time I've, by this is the time I've read Fabiola and Margaret with such intensity. Like, I, I had to, like, you know, keep the tears back. So, um, in a way, I had to draw on my personal story in order to mm. come up with a creative story. And mm. that is why there are so many parallels, as you so nicely put it. Um, so yes, for me, I, I've grown up in Zambia. My mother is Zambian, I'm Zambian, um, but my father is half Nigerian, half Jamaican. Um, and I think growing up, it always was sort of a question, you know, like, so where are you from? And then you sort of hesitate because you feel like packing it all in one sentence, but um, you know, you can't really. <laughs> so I think, Later on, you know, at the time I started to write this book, I was, I think, trying to bring together all of the threads that make the book that you see now today. Um, I was, I had just lost my grandparents on both sides. Um, mm. At the end of the day, I realized the common thing between all them, because they're from all these, they're very diverse places, Jamaica, um, Edo specifically, um, <laughs> In, in Nigeria and here, you know, we, we hail from a, a, a very far away village. And I'm thinking what would bring, what would have brought everything together to have me here now? And I think mm. that central question is what led to the formation of No Be From Here. And ultimately it really was everything that had happened in the, in the sort of just bridging, moving from the pre-colonial to post-colonial and then everyone migrating to England and meeting and mingling there. And I just wanted to find a way to sort of unpack that through these, these people. And initially, it's a story um, about the Ayomide family um, and the Kombe family. Um, initially, it was called Banana Boats. I entered a short story for Zambian Women Writers Association. And I was very surprised when they phoned me one day and they said, ah, Madam, it's Zawa. And I said, who's Zawa? You know, because in Zawa, in Zambia, mm -hmm. Zawa is like Zambia Wildlife <laughs> Authority. <laughs> no, I don't think I shot any impalas. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 we're calling you from the Rights Association. Because at that time, I never really thought a story. I, I don't know. I just didn't think it would grow or develop. And um, 
So it did catch attention at home first. And then I thought, why, why not make this into an actual full story? And I did want to explore, you know, going back to the grandparents' generation, like you've seen with Margaret and Fabiola, and come right <coughs> now, and um, hence the parallels that you see. Okay, it, yeah. it, it's Women's Month, um, it's International Women's Month. And one of the things, obviously, like why I thought to start off with you was because this is such a, such a woman-led uh, story, but one of the most important things that we do, and with that particular chapter that you read actually is, there is often an unsung narrative about women's contribution to Africa's liberation, you know? And, um, you know, we see men all the time and, and, and I like that. And, and what led you to do this or was it, was it personal or, or were you just like, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna do this. We're just gonna go wild. Um, <laughs> it, it actually for me, if I'm very honest, as I say, part of, part of me writing this book was um, me also dealing with the loss of my grandparents on both sides. But as I lost them, I think I realized I knew very little about them. Yes, you know, every year you go for Christmas and all that, but I really then started to interrogate, you know, as they left, where are these people coming from? What were they before they were parents and grandparents? And specifically in, with regards to your question and to this chapter, my grandmother, when she died, all her life she had been um, known as the, a wife of a freedom okay. fighter. She lived as a widow, more time as a widow to a, free, as a freedom fighter than she mm. did, you know, married. And yet that was the title and that was what she told us. But when she died um, and we went to the funeral, mm. I think all former presidents were present, uh, living ones, and they stood there and spoke of her contribution and some of the things she did, risked her life for the struggle that I never would have known before the funeral, prior to the funeral. And that really struck me, that really got me. And I thought if that's her, I can imagine the countless number of, you know, unheard, unsung, and <coughs> un women, people too. I mean, people who perhaps were never brought to the fore for what they've done, for, you know, but it really was a human effort, I think. Mm. And that's why also the, the point of, because Fabiola in this story is her love rival. But mm. for, for this bigger cause, you know, that human, that universal need for this thing to be done with, people, you know, sort of forgot those little lines, those micro lines and said, look, we've got to hold hands and go for it. So it was symbolic in that sense to show that mm. not only women, but yes, many unsung heroes um, do mm. exist. Um, and yeah, that was the point of that chapter. <laughs> You bring up another interesting angle in, in the book. And um, this is the angle of, um, you know, like Pan-Africanist struggles really, because you talk about um, the, the Black Panthers and most people think of Black Panthers as just having been in California, in, 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 in the US, but you bring up the Black Panthers in the, in the, in the UK and their struggle and this particular character was wild and fierce and power and boop small, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So let's Sorry. talk about that. Let's, let's talk about that particular, that particular yeah. angle. I think the, the book definitely throughout sort of gives, you know, it sort of like reverberates the whole um, Pan-African movement because it was. Um, and it wasn't just about one country, especially from Zambia's perspective, both before independence and after. It really was about this united brotherhood, this movement um, and sisterhood, you know, um, again, for the greater cause. So I, I also do feel like none of it was in isolation. You know, anytime I look it up, anytime I read up the history, our, our people here were moving to Ghana to go and raise funds. They were moving to New York to go and talk to Martin Luther King. They were talking with um, you know, the resistance in the UK. So it's, I feel like it's a, it really was a Pan-African movement, you know, um, and, and I did want to bring that up. So I'm really glad that you picked that up. And also, you know, Yasmin ended up marrying CJ, who is Charles and Margaret's son. Fine. And CJ just sort of never had the, he's always been like in the shadow. <laughs> 
So, you know, he's got this freedom fighter dad and mom, and then he's got this freedom fighter wife. She may not be in Africa, but she is, you know, she, she was part of the Brixton riots and all of that. So, um, and he's got this freedom fighter sister. Sorry? <laughs> he's got this freedom fighter sister as well. Margaret, uh, Margaret's mom. So, yeah, it was really interesting to create CJ and sort of show how he was related to all these powerful voices and never mm. quite found his own, you know? But yeah. Mm. <laughs> right. But here's the thing. You work in advertising. And so you had like, you have film, stage. Why did you choose literature? It's like not a lot of people read. You could have like <laughs> put the story in a, in, a, in a bigger platform, I'm saying. That is, that is really interesting. Um, uh, no, first of all, the medium was, it was not a question. Um, I wanted to write this story um, and it just needed to come out. I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. I think once you've got the written word, it can be transformed into various mediums. So mm -hmm. for me, I, I don't see it that way. I don't see it like it ends here. I don't see it like many people don't read. And I do feel like the, the first beat, you know, that first real connection <laughs> <laughs> to your characters. I don't know if anything can transcend writing it, can transcend it in, in the written form. Um, mm. So yeah, it's, yeah, it just sort of, it was what it was. And if it can become a movie one day, that would be great too. <laughs> that would be fantastic, actually. I think it's very cinematic because you're right in a, in a, in a very graphic visual way. And uh, I'm going to ignore Deborah's comment about most people read because, um, yeah, some people read PDF, so it doesn't change <laughs> themselves. Anyway, um, yeah, but I also wanted to explore the relationship between Maggie and Bupe, because one of the things that I absolutely loved about how, about this guy, the, the two of them, is how, how supportive of each other they were, but also how very fierce Bupe was, but she ends up with this loser guy, like why? Like she sticks to this loser guy. Why? Tero. Why you do that? Yeah, but why does everyone stick to their loser guy? You every loser <laughs> guy. Oh, oh. <laughs> gonna do better. <laughs> Debra, don't do that. <laughs> don't be um, nana. <laughs> I think for Wope, Wope specifically, and I always get asked that question, like, why would Wope have, um. I don't know what's the word. She compromised, right? She compromised what she could have. Absolutely, had. she does. And 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 the thing about it is, she, she's probably like, she's a very powerful character. And then she does this thing where you're like, oh, and then, and what? Okay, so I think it's of course I love the interpretation of the readers. It's always magic when you hear what the reader thinks. But from my perspective, when I was writing it, I feel like um, Whoopi when she came to Zambia, right? When she mm. came to Zambia from, from London, from Brixton to be specific, I feel like she came and then found, wow, like there's that much more um, to my heritage or to what I am. And I was trying to, I think, demonstrate how sometimes when privilege mm. or power is given to you, depending on what you do and the character, of course, the nature of the character, um, it can cripple you or it can empower you. And I think for a while, Wupe sort of just like retreated into not knowing what to do, what to do with all of this, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and she's sort of stuck between what she's used to seeing, what she's, you know, what, what's been normal before versus what she can become. Um, and Jerome was, you know, a device, I think. <laughs> Um, to show that, to show that, you know, she was holding on to something, but she could have moved on. He could have moved on. He too had a choice to grow, you know? So, mm. uh, and also just, you know, it's flawed, you know, why do a lot of women stick with the... Like that. Yeah, that's true. No? <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Um, and, then, and then I think the other thing is like, Maggie is, you know, she's quiet, but she's also fierce in certain ways. But I also got the feeling like, sometimes I felt like, hey, you know, you just need to push back on your mother. 
you know. But then I also started thinking about, hey, yeah, pushing back on my mother, you know. <laughs> African mama don't mess around, I'm like, yo! Stella was not like... I'm an African mother, like, yo, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about working through that, like working through those characters. And by the way, what did your mama say and your aunts? Oh, my mom was really grateful because she's like, you know, I was worried that this story would be about us. But when I read about Stella, she's like, I knew that wasn't me. So I'm good, you know. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I know how much it was about her, right? Because that's what my mom said. Like, I remember when my mom read a certain book that I wrote, which I won't mention. She was like, ah, those women are crazy. And then I looked at her and I was like, eh. <laughs> so she didn't know how much it was about her, right? <laughs> I think the first time she read it, she was just coming the pages to check. She's like, I hope we're not in here. Um, and I think she was very relieved when she got to the last page and, and realized that really it was fiction. Um, mm. So Stella, for me, uh, I don't know. Till this day, I don't know why Stella was just Stella. And I will say, and I'll say this now because I'm writing again. And this time I've not had the same experience creatively as I'm having this time around. When I wrote No Be From Here, for some reason, the Ayomi days and the Kombis came, like, came, like, it was just, I, I, you know, spe- Grandmother Margaret first, um, in the first scene that you have in the book. Oh, the that's, a, that's, a, that's such an amazing first scene. I was like, I remember when I read it, I was like, well, how's this chick gonna top this up, you know, because it's such a powerful beginning scene, and then you just went, and you just, you just went, and went, and went, and went, and I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> thank you. Um, so writing Stella was not too difficult because I sort of felt like I had the family, like the family was there. I knew Mm. what Charles was like. I knew what grandma Margaret was like, and I knew what the three children would be like. Um, what I had at first was only up to when their mom dies, Mm. but I think building her was for some reason, it just, I just knew Stella is going to be the tough one. She's going to be the one who's mad at the world and. Um, so it wasn't that difficult to write, but now writing Maggie into it, you know, I think I had an editor who said, but this, she's not too likable. And I was like, I don't care that she's not likable. I think I need to be true to Stella, to to who she is. And also the fact that she's a result of what she's been through. So if I made Mm. her any nicer, I don't think it would speak, it would be authentic to, to Mm. what drives her and therefore the rest of her story and Maggie's story. Ultimately. Okay. Yeah. Uncle Cabasso, was that like, okay, let me throw a gay character, or was that, you know, really like, okay, uh, that's the what? reality, Africans, we all have that family member that we don't talk about, in spite of the fact that we say being gay is not African and stuff, but we all have that family member, we know, you know, and yeah. we have a love, we've kept quiet and stuff and everything, and, but this is our realities, what was Uncle Cabasso? Yeah. Uncle Kabaso, honestly, like the family, when I say I met the three, I already knew Uncle Kabaso would be Uncle Kabaso in all of his self, you know, um, other than his sexual orientation, he just came. So mm. as I said, I knew CJ would be the sort of weak, needy one. Um, Stella mm. would be the one fighting the world and Kabaso would be this big, fuller than life person, but who was different, who had his own other. Um, mm. So I don't think I, I, I didn't go out like looking and saying there has to be some representation inserted to me. He just came naturally. And as he came naturally, I had to think about it because I said, look, I don't, I don't know that experience. Mm. I don't know what it's like to be uh, uh, a queer man growing up in Zambia. I don't know that I never will. But I, when I was honest with myself, I said, no, but I have lived with and seen and had so many friendships with many Kawasos throughout mm. our lives it's just so they I feel like he just mirrored society like the family as a whole mirrored the different kind of people I see every day um so mm. there was no specific like no just because he Kavaso just was and um and I think he lived up to <laughs> he lived up to his character and he was a peacemaker too we needed a peacemaker in the family all right Meg is dead mm-hmm. I was like no, 
Uh, you're not that Nigerian guy. You can't be doing, why did you do that to him? <laughs> because I was just, again, I was just honest to his character. I wasn't doing anything to him. He was just okay, so I was like, oh, come on. And you know? Himself. <laughs> and, and, and he was a kid of privilege. Uh, hi, Leia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, no I'm, not, I'm not implying anything. Um, yeah, well, my Nigerian brothers, Leigh, what's Leigh saying? <laughs> Leigh, you need to read this book, by the way. Emma, nice to see you. But yeah, no. Are there any questions from the audience before I go on? Leigh, we're not Nigeria bashing. We love you guys, huh? Some of our best friends are Nigerian. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are there any know, questions from the audience for Natasha before? Because I can go on and on and on. I have some any uh, comments. comments. Yes. From Emma, she said, uh, totally agree that the uh, opening scene is fabulous. Mm. Oh, thank you, Emma. Thank you. And, uh, but Leia, we all know Tasha is Nigerian. Leia. So is Nigerian. Can I just carry for a second? Go further. What happened, what, how Abisola was, was mm. nothing to, it was not like a Nigeria bash. I mean, it's the same as saying, why did we bash Stella? Like, you know, what kind of Zambian mother is that? <laughs> no, but you didn't bash Stella. Stella, Stella was still doting and St Stella was still doting. She was still like that parent who was there. I mean, she had a fault, but she was very, she was very typically, I could see Stella in my in my mother, in my aunts, in whatever, for including yeah. with her faults, you know. Yeah. But but with Abishola, I was like, ah, guy, you know, he's like, <laughs> he was pulling a four one nine scam of those days. <laughs> no, but a four one nine of those days. You know, you know? He's spoiled, really. He's just he's just, you know, a guy. I from suppose so. and he just was spoiled. The world I, I, I suppose so. Like but, perhaps. So yeah, no, perhaps it was more also commentary on, 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 on raising children and how, how, you know, like giving them too much and whatever can sometimes end up messing them up. And perhaps that's, that's what it was, but yeah, no, but he was also, he was also, he's also like a guy, like I, I, I'd want to look up when I go to Lagos and drink with, because he also was like, he's that guy, you know, you're like, no, oh, he knows where the best pepper soup spots are and so forth and so on, you know? True, 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 true. Yeah. But also, I think anyway. for me when I was writing him, and I feel like it's universal. I don't. I, I mean, I can't speak for every African country, but I can speak from here. There, there seems to be like the the post freedom fighter generation, sort of that were pampered, and then you sort of like wonder, but you know, <laughs> you know what? Why weren't you able to? walk into your parents shoes for instance and i think abisola is sort of like representing that i think um and then stella would be the opposite of that she was the one who's really trying to fill those shoes so yeah. i think each of them had their sort of way of mirroring um society mm -hmm. post-colonialization and abisola just happened to be who he was one of the things that that i found interesting which i thought was also a parallel with like current african leadership is how you know the 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 father of this family sends his children to like go to school in the UK. Yet he's a leader in a government in Africa. Like he hasn't got into a space where he trusts his own system that he's running now. What is that? You know, uh, because I see it also happening where it's like, oh, okay, you get sick. Oh yeah, by the way, let's go to the let's go to to. To Germany, let's go to whatever. And yet you're a minister of, of, of health in this country. You, your children are in school in the UK, yet you're a minister of education in an African country. Um, was, that, was that deliberate on your part? Yes, or it was. was it like actually from observation or you were playing with that? Or um, was I think it was a combination of both the reflection of what, mm. of what it was like and also an irony, I don't know. It's a really weird, like remnant of post-colonialization where on one hand, you're like, look, we need to fight so that we're independent. But on the other hand, you want to do things exactly like the people you just asked to leave were doing. And as you're saying, 
where you trust whatever it is they brought to you more than what you have. And I feel like it's just such, it's just a reflection. It's just a reflection of how deep the indoctrination was, um, how deep it was that nothing at home is good enough, you know? And it's still to this day, it just rolled over. It just kept, it just kept you know, it's like generations were, um, and we're still dealing with it, you know? So I, yeah, it was sort of like a micro example, I think, of showing how we, you know, just how deep that indoctrination was. And, and um, I don't know if they ever realized how far it would go, you know, in terms of generations and future and impact, like okay. you say, not fixing your medical but <laughs> We've got an Afro later question from Adeleye. And okay. so, you know, it's gonna be one of those questions. <laughs> and his question is, in light of recent revelations around Meghan and Harry's reasons for quitting the royal family, what can you tell us about the price of Gary across African countries? And how is this reflected in your work? <laughs> that is hilarious. I'm like, okay, how do we connect these? Are they parallel? What do we call them? <laughs> <laughs> you must I'm just find a way. I think let's ask Idris Elba because everyone knows Idris Elba knows everything, right? <laughs> the time asking Megan and Ari, go to Idris and he'll tell you something. <laughs> Helen, uh, the book is not yet available in um, in prestige books, but I know it's going to be here very soon because I understand there is um, a distribution deal that's being done throughout the continent. So we have all these books on the continent. Emma wants to know uh, about your writing process. The novel is quite complex structurally in that it's set in several different time periods. Um, Some cities. Can you talk about a bit about that process? Did you plan the novel and write it in that way that it ended up? Or did you write each time period and then put it together? And why did you decide to divide it into the two parts? There's three parts. Are they not three parts? Um, okay, so I uh, I didn't set out I didn't set out to write a book called Make From Here, if I'm very honest. Um, initially, I wrote a short story. Like I said, it was actually called Banana Boat, and it was more about it was set in the '60s, looking at the army days and the combis, first time around, and it was a hideous, hideous short story. Like I hope no one ever did stuff. I'm like, oh no. Um, but I was just talking about, and I think I needed, uh, you know, like a smaller place to like draft, if that makes sense, to start to painting and then start to grow it out. So initially, it was it was the story about the family in the sixties, and that one came to me like a real impulse. Like I was, I know I was napping in the afternoon on a Saturday, and I just got up. And out of nowhere, I just started researching everything to do with um, with that time period, specifically with those families. And I just began to write. Um, but I put it away for about a year or so. And then later on, as I had said, I think I, I'm not sure if I mentioned here, I traveled to Nigeria to visit my grandparents, who I had not seen since I was quite small, since I was six. And um, by the time I went to see them, they were, they were all... Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time getting familiar with them and also Nigeria, sort of mourning time that had been lost in between when I was a child and now as an adult. I began to write, sort of like capture the feelings of returning, the feelings of a homecoming, the feelings of meeting them again. Um, and I think that started as its own separate thing, its own separate project. Um, and then I began to write the story. Somehow, somewhere, I was like, oh, okay, it's actually you, the Ayomi days and the Kombis. And, and then this feeling of going back home and like these people are going. And so I started to write the story and I, I started to mess it and come up with the story. But it is only afterwards, I think after I got a few, um, a bit of feedback from beta readers, that they were missing the Margaret story, the grandmother story. And I remember with my editor saying, you know, but then if 
that were to happen, what would you do? And just, look, the simplest way is every time she comes up with a question, give us something about her. And so the the grandmother Margaret scene came last. They came right at the end. They came after the whole book had been written and rewritten. And then only afterwards did I start to put them in. And then I looked at it and it worked and I was surprised. And and here we are today. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, perhaps a final question. Food makes such an important presence in your book. Yeah. Can we talk about African delicacies, African meals, African food? You know, because I was like, you made me hungry while I was reading that book. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do hope if, if um, we do another print or something, um, I hope we can put like, I know it sounds silly, but I really did from the beginning, from the first draft, I think I really wanted to have um, a mix of, um, sorry, of um, sort of like, you know, dishes and their ingredients and stuff in the book at the back or the front, whatever they want to do. And I've seen it work in the henna artist. So I think, you know, I'm hinting to my publisher. So, um, and also because it's a combination of food from everywhere, I feel like even as a child, um, distinguishing between like at home, we all have, in Zambia we'll eat chihuahua. And then, you know, my grandmother would make rice and peas and my aunties would make a goosey. So ever since I was little, like I always had to, I think I'll call it a privilege. I was privileged enough to like have all these really nice delicacies from everywhere. And I sort of wanted that to reflect um, in the work. So I'm happy to know that it made you hungry, <laughs> but it would be nice yeah, to do that. And now we've come to the exciting part of this discussion. Yay. Deco, there's such an authenticity in the characters that I could identify with being Zambian. And um, let me see your full comment. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, it has disappeared on me. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Are you, are you looking for the comment of Seko? For, for Seko's comment, yes, please, yeah. deadly. Can you read that for me? There is such an um, authenticity in the characters uh, that I could identify with being Zambian that makes or made the characters I would, wouldn't would necessarily identify which as easily, much more believable. Um, there is such a value in seeing uh, someone or something you can connect with to draw in to draw you in, especially for an occasional reader like myself. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that comment, Seko. And this is why we have virtually yours, because we try to bring you literature from the continent that you can identify with by writers from this continent. And now the exciting part. Detlef, can I start? Can I can I start picking up people? Yes. Just be yes! careful that okay. there isn't Dekwa also with us, who won already yes. three times. <laughs> yeah, no, we hope he doesn't win this time. Okay. Um, I don't know whether 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 a director can win from the Guta Institute. Is that is that legal? Uh, there is no director from the Goethe India yeah, um, from the Goethe there Center. Is Barbara Sommer. Barbara Sommer. It's the Goethe Center. It's not a Goethe Institute. I think we can accept. Okay, it's Goethe Centrum. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara Sommer so from Uganda. To? Yes. yes, thank you. But I won also last time, so I don't know if there's somebody else. <laughs> no, don't worry. Deborah has won every time, so it's good. You can win, Barbara. Just uh, I will send you an email, and you're first winner. I'll send you an email, and I'll either put the book on the bus for you from Nairobi, or we will fly it to you from Joburg. But thank yes, you, you are thank first you. winner, Barbara. And in any case, go to Zentram, needs more books by Africans in its library, doesn't it? And Natasha yes. is certainly a great way to add to this thing. Okay, that's our first winner. Our second winner is from Namibia. Oh. Yes. Um, Sati and N. Lifo. Sati. 
M N Lepo. Sati. Yes. Sati did not um, turn in. Okay. Well, Sati did not turn up, so that's fine. Uh, we get another whatever we throw away, Sati. Let's find our next winner. Um, right. Um, another Namibian, Elizabeth Norbert. Is Elizabeth Norbert in the house? No, I checked. Okay, uh, Elizabeth sorry. Norbert is not here. Oh but my but God. There, this are, there, are, there are some Namibians. Zebra oh. has a good way of winning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, next, wow, another Namibian is Kuhepa Tonju. He's there, Kuhepa. Kuhepa. Hey, hello, 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 hello. Congratulations, you're second winner. Thank you, group. thank you very much. I will send you an email and then you can give us your address and we will mail the books to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Can I ask? Yes. I wanted to ask Natasha, um, how much is the lobola in um, Jamaica, Nigeria, and Zambia? <laughs> oh, wow, Kepa. I'm not really sure. I think you have to ask my husband. I think he's more up to date with the, with the rates. No, 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 no. <laughs> Leye, you, can, you can't be saying, Leye, you cannot be saying that she's married. A woman does not stand on one leg. <laughs> Our next winner is from Rwanda is Patience Iribagiza in here. Patience. Patient from Rwanda. Uh, yes, from Rwanda. Patience Iribagiza. No, she unfortunately not. Okay, she's not here, so okay, we still need our third winner. Oh God. Um, right. Uh, Jacob Mwine Charimpa. Jacob. Is Jacob um, here? Jacob Mwine Charimpa going once. Going twice, Jacob is not in the house. All right, still looking for our third winner. <clears throat> is Hilda in the house over in Uganda? What was the name? Hilda from Yere in Uganda, Femrite. Um, okay, Hilda is not in the house. Nope, nope. Right, uh, next. Okay, this is, damn, Hilda like registered more than once. <laughs> that was Hilda again. <laughs> All right, Madhu, is Madhu around? Madhu Krishna? I'm here, but I already have a copy. Give it to someone else. Oh, all right. So let me give it to somebody else. Okay, Madhu, thank you. And thank you so much for always having all the copies of the books we have before we start discussing them. Thank uh, you. Okay. Um, that's it for in. All right. Um, is BC in the house? BC! BC, BC, nope. BC. Not, oh, not okay. Really. This is not in the house, so she doesn't get that book. Um, right. Imagine we're still looking for a third winner. Jenny Chilongo. Ha ha. No, BC would not have wanted you to have that book. Jenny Chilongo is Jenny Chilongo in the house. She didn't. No. She didn't turn. No, in. she's not. Okay. Right. Ranka. Ranka Pramod. Ranka is there, yeah. I'm here there and I don't yet have this book. Hi, Ranka. You already have the book. No, I don't. So I would really like a copy of this book. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic, Ranka. I'm sending it to you. 
I will get your address on WhatsApp or some other place or, you know, whatever. Thank you. Oh, God. Oh, God. Degwa. When you people don't turn up, this is what happens. Degwa has won a game. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Negra gets the fourth book after turning up for the fourth time so a four and four he's got like 100 wins i'm very relieved that now, he got it because he asked for when did we have that discussion Degwa? like two weeks ago <laughs> so i'm really glad thank you <laughs> Negra is rigging things man <laughs> Uh, fifth winner is Lorraine Stolle in the house. Oh, Lorraine. But she's not here. Lorraine. Well, she's not here. That's great. Because she's also a past winner. So we don't want these people to keep winning. Uh, in fact, I think I'll stop putting Degwa's name <laughs> on the list. <laughs> Philip Ogonda is Philip in the house, who is also a past yeah. winner. Yeah. Yeah. Are you here, Philip? Yes. I'm here. And how I'm did here. you enjoy uh, our last offering? Uh, the last book you won, I think it was... Um, First two months. Yes. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was actually nice. I think it's, uh, it's my second favorite book currently. Oh. After, After Marlon James. Men of the South. After Marlon James. Uh, brief After history. Men of the South. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, Philip, Philip, why are you like this? Anyway, thank you, everyone. This has been absolutely amazing. We are coming up next time. Next, so this is our book this time. Uh, Natasha Omokorian's Nobi from here. It will absolutely be available all over this continent very soon, but it's currently available in South Africa, in Zambia, and well, you know, I got a copy in Kenya, but you have to be nice to me for me to send you a copy because you haven't won. So we've got like a two people with one from Kenya, Philip and the Riga with Ndewa. We've got Ranka winning from the UK. We've got, um, we've got um, Barbara and we from, have- From Uganda? Uh, yes. So Barbara from Uganda, Ndewa and Philip from Kenya and uh, Kuhepa and from Kuhepa. Namibia. Kuhepa from Namibia. Okay, so this is our current book. Our next book is this one, um, Dreams and Assorted Nightmares by Abubakar Adam Ibrahim, which is a collection of short stories. And we are going to, Ndewa, we're not gonna include you. So don't say you have to win anything. <laughs> and we're going to have Abu Bakr in the second week of the month of April, and he's going to be hosted by um, Guta Institute uh, Johannesburg in collaboration with our fantastic host Guta Namibia, who are the initiators of this. And then our uh, third one will be a local, and that's Yvonne at the Amboa War, the Dragonfly Sea, and that will be in May. I look forward to being with you in the next month. And I'm broadcasting from, to you from Prestige Books in Nairobi, which is the greatest, 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 greatest bookshop that you can have with all the writers. And I promise you, if you don't have a book, if you're in Nairobi, you don't have a book, they generally uh, and it's not available in Nairobi or in Kenya. They can get it to you within two weeks. So Prestige Books, they've got two branches, one in uh, Mamangina and another one in Lavington. So yes, see you next time. And thank you very much. And Tash, thank you so, so, so much for being thank part of this. Guys. Thank you so much. I know it's a Saturday afternoon. It's so nice to have you all. Thank you, Declive. Um, and thank you, Zuki. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Detlef, last word. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for turning in. There was um, yeah, a lot of countries all over Namibia. And I, I must say the uh, Mutale also turned in from California at five o'clock in the morning. He said he could wow. not resist. Can you believe it? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, 
And I would like to close the session with another um, music. I could not resist uh, come back to the Melissa's Way Brothers again. Um, mm. Yeah, just relax for three minutes and then um, uh, listen to the Melissa's Way Brothers with, with the song Choice. And uh, hope to see you next time. And thank you very much, Natasha. Thank you very much, Susik, uh, Sukiswa. See you next time. Absolutely. So, up, oh, let's. Hey, this is the Melissa's Brothers, Mark, Seth, and Zachary. Thank you, that left. Oh, bye bye. Now with my mic. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thank bye, you. everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Right. And way out.